Brethren, we must become more bitter. Bitterness is the best antidote to the Christian slave pox, which for 2,000 years has poisoned our blood. Said Emerson, the doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love when that pules and wine. Well, today, we are all pulers and whiners. We are born such and, and rarely outgrow it. Bitterness is the only thing which can tear the bandage of idealism from our eyes and enable us to see life as the old, unseduced Greeks and Romans saw it. And then, when we can see life as the Greeks and Romans saw it, perhaps we will have no further use for bitterness and can throw it away. When the poison of idealism is extirpated, then perhaps will come to pass the saying of Zarathustra, growth in wisdom is measured by decrease in bitterness. It must be said, although it will be misunderstood, only he who has been once thoroughly bitter can know how sweet love is. Man is fearfully and wonderfully made, and truly our heaven and our hell are inseparably intertwined. Avant, logician, you have no antimonies like those of the human heart. This, this prayer for bitterness has relieved me immensely. If the mere aspiration for bitterness thus makes blessed, how ecstatic must be a deed of bitterness. Again, Emerson said, All laws are laughable, but those which men make for themselves. What is time to say that all Bibles are to be rejected, save that which we write for ourselves? The Bible of Jesus, of Goethe, of Hein, of Emerson, of Whitman, of Thoreau, of Nietzsche. All these may help us somewhat, but we must have pride enough to demand a Bible not borrowed from the neighbors. A slave may rest content with a Bible writ by another. The free man must write his own. Vicarious suffering, vicarious salvation are out of date. We may weep over the sorrows of Jesus and Nietzsche. We may rejoice over their triumphs, but we are not saved till we weep over our own sorrows and rejoice in our own happiness. Till we are deified by our own Calvary. Till we can show our own Via Dolorosa, our own Gethsemane, agony and exaltation. The egoist learns to say, I too have a divine record. The record of my innermost griefs, sorrows, temptations, triumphs, tears, and rejoicings. We no longer accept salvation secondhand. We demand an original, an egoistic salvation. Saved we are by love of self, pity for self, tears for our own incommunicable woe. But last and best revelation, we are taught to strengthen and purify ourselves by laughing over our dire mistakes. Such laughter is the divinest emotion. Jove and the lions never weep, but often laugh. The artist only reaches the last summit of his greatness when he learns how to laugh at himself. He alone can go forward. But someone says, does a religion of egoism cure our sorrows, as did the old religion? To which we reply, what sorrows? Whose sorrows? The sorrows of a fool? To all such, we say, the new gospel is not milk for crying babies. We may add that the greatest injury you can do to a fool is to cure his sorrow, his only teacher and the wise man will cure his own sorrows. After all, the new religion deals generously enough with the sorrowing one. It makes each one of us the only God in the universe. What more do you want? And if God cannot cure his own sorrows, well, the world will begin to doubt his divinity. We repeat 
what we learned in the cradle. That it is a shame not to have our own Bible and God in our own ego's home. It is a shame to be obliged to borrow these from the neighbors. Moreover, the founders of the new religions have always lived above the question of consolation, and every egoist is the founder of a new religion.